He was looking good with the beard. He was yeah. looking real good with the beard. Yeah, he no, should have kept the he, beard. He, he was looking handsome with the beard. I'm not going to lie. I was like, I don't typically see Billy Crystal as like a very handsome man, but with the fall fashion. Mike Wazowski, like those, he's got a good eye. <laughs> those cable knit sweaters with like the little bit of scruff, you know, the depression scruff. I was like, <laughs> he, he's looking pretty good right now. <laughs> Welcome back to Great American Movie Review, where we review great American movies. My name is Kyle. And I'm Micaiah. This is a Movie of the Week style podcast where we take turns picking films and we talk about their context and quality. This week, I have selected the 1989 romantic comedy When Harry Met Sally. The film follows Harry and Sally after they graduate from college in Chicago and they make a drive to New York together. The next 10 years, it has them encountering each other a couple of times, and then eventually they do become friends, and it kind of follows their journey, and this is a rom-com, so and their romantic entanglements as well. The film is directed by Rob Reiner and written by Nora Ephron, and stars Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal. It was a massive success, making $93 million on a $16 million budget, which in today's terms is $148 million on a $39 million budget. I think it was the 11th highest grossing movie of that year. Uh, for Rated R as well. So. And for Rated R. I think got, it's still... Got to keep that into account. Yeah, That's really good. I think it's still in the top 200 highest grossing Rated R movies ever. So... It Without also, adjusting for inflation, probably. So yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. It also received an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay for Efron. So, Micaiah. Yes, Kyle. Why'd you bring this movie up? Um, Just because I love this movie. It, it has huge... Um, That's a fair reason. Autumn vibes, too. You know, there's just a lot of autumnal uh, scenery. Uh, it takes place throughout the year, but I think that its strongest identifying you know, season is definitely fall. And I just, you know, the leaves are changing colors and we're out of the horror movie season. And I just wanted to watch something that I like and it makes me laugh and I feel good watching it. I'd say fall definitely does have that like comfort kind of season yeah. quality where winter is more cozy because you're, you're inside, you're, you're cuddling up by a fireplace. Spring is like the, the get stuff done season. And then summer's like the relaxing and vacationing kind of season so yeah the fall being that kind of comfort i can understand that yeah it's cozy it's like it's a nice movie and um we haven't really talked about this is we haven't really talked about one a lot of comedies and also just um this will be our first romantic comedy that we've gone through yeah i would say this is our first comedy yeah it like makes what, me laugh what you would think of comedy yeah for yeah. sure it's definitely written to be that um so i i had seen this movie it's been a good probably 15 years mm. but yeah i definitely still laughed at some of the it's mostly it was mostly billy crystal that made yes. me laugh because he's got that <laughs> yeah also i uh man if you close your eyes you can really just imagine mike wazowski absolutely he, he does not change his voice <laughs> at, at all but yeah mike wazowski and and meg ryan um both of them do a fantastic job absolutely absolutely superb yeah there's a 12 year age difference between them and honestly you don't really feel it at all in this movie and i mean it's not like they're both it's not like a weird 12 year age difference she's in her late 20s no it's not christina ritchie like versus 40. johnny yeah. depp kind of kind of yeah uh age gap i'd i'd say it's 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 much closer and it's also because billy crystal he's much much younger than you expect in this movie and that's because we we know him from from later movies or we know him from his voice work so yeah um people was... going back and watching this i was surprised i remembered yeah. him as being much older but then again i was uh very young when i first watched this movie yeah. so yeah it makes sense i think he was 40 when they filmed this so that uh, sounds about right i think he was born in um i think he was born in 48 yeah so yeah because they filmed it in 88 so yeah and meg ryan i think was 28 when they filmed it so but like it's not uh, 20 28 or 27 yeah i guess they were both adults though like that's like a, yes that's like an appropriate age range and it the, they have the thing that we were talking about with sleepy hollow with like the lack of chemistry with a romantic comedy you have to have good chemistry otherwise yep. the whole movie doesn't work and they have fantastic chemistry together otherwise it feels like the room yeah 
<laughs> You're tearing me apart, Lisa. Yeah, well, that's bad it chemistry <laughs> and bad performances. Yes, it is. So, um, well, the two can go hand in hand sometimes. They you kind of have to have a really good performance in order to like from both yeah. uh, characters in order to get that chemistry. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, it's just one who is doing a good performance, kind of the emotional anchor, whereas the other other one is giving a bad performance and it doesn't work off as or work out as well. Yeah, I'd say absolutely and yeah i think this i mean this was kind of meg ryan's big breakout film and then she got kind of pigeonholed into these romantic comedies a lot of them written by nora efron so yep. um, sleepless in seattle you've got mail yeah those yeah. three in particular um which tom hanks was also uh one of the one of the several actors considered for the role of harry before uh billy crystal so it's not surprising why right. nora efron would go for tom hanks in in the future movies with yeah. Meg Ryan. I think that this movie, I like that it's um, Billy Crystal here, because Billy Crystal's just so quick with, like, his yeah. type of comedy, and it just really works for that kind of neurotic. Um, Efron actually talked about this in one of the interview things um, that I saw on the, uh, the Blu-ray, uh, where she said that the way that she thinks about romantic comedies is that there's two different like styles there's the christian romantic comedies and the jewish romantic <laughs> comedies and in the christian ones there's some obstacle that comes into their path that prevents them from being together whereas in the jewish ones which she cites woody allen as being like a primary thing i would also throw oh, any hall sure yeah i would also throw albert brooks in there too with like modern romance and the types of movies he makes but it's more so the neuroses of the characters that gets in the way of anything, you know, it's just the that nerd. also might have something to do with with New York style comedy as a yeah. whole, because New York style comedy is quick. It's loud and it's in, not in a good or a bad way, but um, it's it's quick. It's loud. It's neurotic, but it's also cynical. So yes. and you can definitely tell that by the fact that New York is one of the breeding grounds for great comedians. Yeah. Because they have to fight their way to the top when it comes to getting through all this, the shit that comedians have to get through in order to get that style of comedy. Right. And I think Billy Crystal nails it also because I'm pretty sure he's, uh, they say in, in, in this movie he's from New Jersey, but I'm pretty sure he's from New York, isn't he? Billy Crystal, yeah. Crystal and Rob Reiner yeah, he's from and Manhattan, so. Efron are all New York people. Yeah. Uh, and... So and it's kind of interesting too because it's this movie comes across as a very collaborative effort, like from because I listened to a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and even the director's commentary that had Efron, surprise, surprise, Crystal and Reiner all on it, and uh, and yeah, the way that they talk about it is like there's this big just like everybody's providing stuff and all of the best stuff that everybody brought to the table was put in the movie um that's like crystal's improvisations and his yeah, ideas. entire scenes entire scenes yeah. were improvised like the the uh cat's delicatessen scene obviously the most famous scene in the film even though i don't think it's the best i think it's well written i think it's well performed and i think it's iconic yeah I'd, i i would consider the museum scene and the honestly the i'd consider the ending scene to be better I would consider, oh, even yeah. though it's it was kind of ham fisted and put in there at the last second, they weren't supposed to fall in love at the end. They were supposed to just remain friends. But um, Rob Reiner discovered actually his future wife after after being divorced, which was based on what yeah. this movie was about with Nora Ephron. But he he found his future wife while filming this. Yep. So obviously he's going to have a change of heart when it comes to um, falling in love and that kind of thing. So I, I can see why it's put in there. I just don't think, I, I do think the structure of the story didn't really lead to it, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. I just think it's, it's um, weird. In the, in the commentary that I listened to, Efron said that the, them not getting together was, didn't make it past the first draft. So it was already changed before they really even got to filming because they, so Rob Reiner approached Efron for an idea for a film um because she had been a novelist for some time and right um he so he approached her and they worked on this and throughout the time that they were working on getting this thing off the ground rob reiner made like two other movies <laughs> which were probably stand by me and the princess bride <laughs> and uh before this movie actually became what it was and then even throughout filming when different ideas would come in they'd have it go back to her and she'd like write out scenes and change scenes 
So it's a very collaborative process. And like um, Crystal was very much an extension of like you were saying, Rob Reiner, because the inspiration coming from his own experience and his divorce and his depression there. Um, Efren liked to say that Rob Reiner would take out his depression like a little stuffed toy, like a stuffed dog, and like, <laughs> you know, like show it off and everything. That's how he would kind of treat his depression. <laughs> um, so then that's, you kind of get that with Billy Crystal and kind of like his, like, especially like early on when he's like, do you ever think about death? <laughs> you know? And it's so, yeah, that's one of the first things, that's yeah, one of the first things he says. It's so juvenile in a way. Yeah, when uh, I when I start reading a book, I read the last page. That way, I know what happens in the case I die. <laughs> in case I die, stuff like that. It's just like that comes from a depressed way of thinking, and it's also somewhat juvenile. Um, so, I think that this movie does a great job of like evolving these characters. Um, and uh, you, Sally is largely an extension of Efron herself. Um, apparently the ordering thing was something that Rob Reiner noticed Efron doing and was like, we have to put that in the script. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and now but, that's one of the more. Uh, what I, what things. I like about Harry's character specifically and the way Billy Crystal plays him, but Harry's character specifically, he'll, he'll make a backhanded joke. Like you're a bit high maintenance, aren't you? But then he'll, then he'll stare at her and be like totally entranced by her and then go like, wow, you, you are attractive, aren't you? And and that's specifically the diner scene, the first diner scene. Right. But he also he also has a way of using comedy, or he he deflects quite a bit when he is sure what he's feeling, but he doesn't want to show it. So the museum scene, uh, they talk about her going on a date. He he acts all fine with it. We don't know if he's not fine with it, but he definitely does make the. You know what? I I, I always thought that hieroglyphics were just a an ancient comic strip. He immediately deflects and goes to something yeah. else. Because he comments that he's like, you look, I think you should wear more. He's like, is that what you're going to wear? She's like, yeah. yeah. And he's like, I think you should wear skirts more. You look really good in skirts. Yep. And then she kind of looks at him and she has a little smile. But it, before it can go anywhere, he deflects it somewhere else because he didn't want to, like, if there was any resistance that he was feeling there to, like, a romantic thing, he clearly just, like, avoided it there. He also does the same thing at the end. He he comments yeah. on the, all uh, for all acquaint acquaintance be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And he he immediately does that after the climax of the movie. So right, yeah, but yeah, and it, it, there though it feels like her response to it too, and joking along with him in that scene, kind of. Um, Efron says that's how you know it's going to work out for him because they just are, have the ability to just make each other laugh and they enjoy each other's company, which is I think sure. what this movie does really well is just kind of that period of time in the middle of the movie where they're just becoming friends and then are friends. If you didn't, I, I really buy just that chemistry of their friendship. I think it's great. And uh, that's it kind, kind of, of, yeah. Yeah. It, it brings up like an interesting conversation of, uh, well, of course, the movie explicitly brings up the conversation of can men and women be friends if there's no sex involved? Billy Crystal at the start says no, but then they start becoming friends. Um, and obviously, it's, a, it's very much a friends thing, but you kind of get that they're soulmates, but they don't see it yet. So right. it's kind of, can friends be soulmates in a way? Right. I think, it, yeah, it kind of is that. And then once they both kind of realize it, that's when, which I think is probably also why the movie ending changed, because I know they reshot some of the ending too um, to mm -hmm. make these changes. So, yeah, uh, I think that that's a good, I think that the movie presents the question of can men and women really be friends because sex gets in the way. And I don't think that's actually the question that the movie is that interested in by the end of it, because I think it evolves no. out of that. I think it grows out of that question. I think that's a limited mindset kind of thought. And it, it's a really smart and well-written movie. It still has the cynicism, I think, of like a Woody Allen or an Albert Brooks. Sure. But I do, it does have something that, one, makes it more populous, which would explain its success, you know, with like its happy ending and everything. But also, I think it earns it. I really do. And I think that the script and the all of everything that goes into this is just intelligent enough and in tune enough. It feels very honest even when it does go the more pleasingly like romantic comedy aspects of it. It just feels very honest from the perspective of all of the people involved in making this movie. And to that extent, even if something, it's very much of its time um, in terms of the conversations, yet it was still very progressive for the time that it came out. It was 89. So 
that just and I'll hold that it's it's somewhat timeless in the yeah. topics that it decides to talk about. Yes, maybe not so much the dialogue when it talks about. Um, ob- obviously, when it comes to the promiscuity of of men and women and that kind of thing, that's yeah. going to change. That's going to fluctuate. That's a cyclic cyclical thing. I can point to in today's society. It's a very very promiscuous whether that be good or bad it's a very promiscuous society that we have right now or at least in in most major cities i would say yeah. but it was kind of in those times too even though people didn't talk about it always yeah but, so having a populist movie like this that's generally appealing be able to talk about these things in a more honest way i, I think would was still probably a refreshing thing for the time yeah because you'd get these kind of movies, like I mentioned earlier, Albert, Bro- Albert Brooks's Modern Romance and Woody Allen films. Annie that Hall's would, very honest. I'm yeah, sorry. they would talk about these things, but those movies ended up, those movies aren't as populous, I don't think. They don't make you feel good at the end of it. And it just kind of like, you get a lot of the cynicism kind of, I think, over, like, and the honesty in the cynicism overwhelms the fact that you can be honest and still be optimistic. So I really like that about this film. Yeah. I will also bring up the fact that you said the ending is definitely earned by the end. I'll just bring bring this up in like a case of like well-written movies. When we talk about certain scenes that are iconic, it's not just those scenes. It's the scenes that build up to it. Yeah. That really nail it. So when we talk about when we talk about great movies when we talk about this we can't really just talk about one scene we've got to talk about the whole thing because the whole thing builds up to the whole thing yeah so the result is better than the sum of its parts I yeah say. yeah i love the um build up like in the beginning too where you have that initial car ride that really sets up these characters mm-hmm. and then when they separate deciding that they can't be friends because men and women can't be friends and kind of you know they rubbed each other the wrong way even though they were clearly like kind of fascinated by just how different they were from each other i think because <laughs> you have the hilarious thing with like billy crystal one of the first things he does is he just pulls some grapes out and he just starts spitting grapes spits it into the window and <laughs> says oh i'll roll the window down. I'll, I'll roll the window down <laughs> yeah and so it cuts every time that he spits a grape to outside the car and it's just i don't know it's really funny editing there um yep. And uh, but then, yeah, after that whole first car ride where that really establishes these characters, then it cuts five years and they bump into each other again. Um, And she's dating this character, Joe, who's actually played by Gerald Ford's son, Gerald Ford's son, Steve, (laughs) (laughs) which is an odd just trivia bit for this movie. Well, (laughs) I mean, I mean, Crystal or uh, Harry is a political consultant, so it kind of makes sense. Maybe, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> canon that's canon yeah but it's really funny because he like has like a momentary flash of recognition of her um at first but then, but he, then he knows him off. but then he knows him and then they mm-hmm. end up on the plane like together <laughs> and that's kind of they have a whole conversation through the plane and then a great shot university where, of chicago i yeah. knew it was you <laughs> yeah like on the plane the guy gives up his seat for him <laughs> which is just so nice that dude's the real under- I, that, honestly, that dude's the real hero absolutely, of the story <laughs> absolutely yeah and then you get like it ends with the great shot of them walking on like one of those uh people movers um which apparently they had to shoot a bunch of times <laughs> because they wanted to like yeah. keep it very natural and keep it in one shot so which is crazy, yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually like those there's people a few, movies are not that long. No, there's there's a few things in here where it's like there's some really dynamic, just like performance, like juggling going on with like getting the beats down right. Um, I'll talk about another scene later that apparently took like sixty takes to get right. Uh, yeah, you're talking about the phone call scene between all yes, four of them. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so apparently Bruno forgot his forgot yeah, his line in like, like the fifty fourth take, and yeah. they were like, "No, we got this perfect." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, this was a similar kind of thing where they had to do a bunch of takes just because the rhythm of the scene had to flow within a very limited time frame. But it, it, then, then after that, they separate again, and then another five years pass, and then you get their friendships established. You get the Bruno Kirby character, Jess, with uh, as Harry's friend, and then you get um, the introduction of Carrie Fisher's character, and I forget Mar- the other uh, actors. Marie. Yeah, Marie is Carrie Fisher's character, and then the other friend too. I forget her name, but she's not as important in the movie um oh amanda at the start i think that's her, the redheaded friend no no uh, not amanda uh, amanda, no. 
the no. third the um, third in that trio um of do, is she in more than like two scenes though uh she's in a few because she like her and her her husband i assume are like at like the charades party and you see him at, oh like, at the few, wedding sure yeah you see him at the wedding too so yeah she's not like a major character but she is in a few scenes which but, i'm gonna bring it up the uh the backhanded uh comment from jess bruno from jess of the uh shout out to harry and sally if either of us had found them remotely attractive we wouldn't be here right that's such a new york thing to say yeah no it, it's that, really that, funny that in, that compliment what you think would be a compliment uh is absolutely the worst backhand backhanded kind of insult well especially after um harry and sally having it out and sally slapping mm-hmm. harry a perfect movie slap <laughs> <laughs> and walk out and then he says that it's just really funny like little punch to it. um they have a, a lot slap of good, and a punch yeah they have a lot of good comedic editing in this where it's like like there's one point where he's calling her a bunch after they did sleep together and he's like leaving a bunch of voicemails he's like i don't know i don't want to be a schmuck and then it cuts to him like on the phone singing you yep. know to her leaving another voicemail and there's a lot of stuff like that in this movie and that's when that... she picks up and he's all surprised because right. you know it's been going on for months <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah the back to the introduction of like the carrie fisher character which carrie fisher on un- unfortunately she's not like in a ton of different things because she's so great especially in like comedic roles i think God, she... blues brothers she's so good in it oh man i haven't seen blues brothers yeah oh man so that's that's on the list it's too. a shame because you would you, she's after star wars she's basically just in a, a bunch of side character roles right and it's a shame but you can also tell uh as a person who's followed her th- or not in real time through her career but if you haven't seen wishful drink or haven't watched the, uh her wishful drinking i think it's a comedy special but read her book or the princess diaries or her other book i will look it up because i forget the name but she changes so much in the span of a decade it's crazy yeah like she looks nothing like she looks in uh the star wars trilogy or blues brothers in this movie even though it's nine years after eight years after blues brothers and i i know the reasons why it's it's having to do with the electroshock therapy she got for what was diagnosed as manic depression at the time and also the the drug abuse but man it's uh seeing yeah. her so different throughout her years and her, the way her voice changes and you can really tell in the sequel trilogy of star wars but it's just as it's so unfortunate yeah i uh, yeah but she's so great in this movie she's um, great in this movie yeah she has a lot of i, mean, I am she, honey she, i am never gonna want that coffee table <laughs> yeah that's such a great delivery right yeah, there i love that and like even just like that first scene she's going through the rolodex um mm-hmm. <laughs> and she's like oh you wouldn't mind this guy she doesn't have a problem with chins <laughs> you know, like stuff like that <laughs> and she's like in denial about this married guy that she's with she's like <laughs> and meg ryan's also great like jo- comedically jo- in this joe and i joe and i separated oh so you mean he's single <laughs> <laughs> yeah but there's also um the she's like he's never gonna leave his wife is she it's and meg ryan's always like nobody thinks that he's going to leave his wife <laughs> yeah postcards from the edge is what i was talking about it's right. kind of an autobiographical uh well it's fictional but it's, it's kind of based on her her life when she was abusing drugs so mm. it's a very interesting take so yeah that's all i wanted to say we yeah can move up. i've not read those so that's good to plug <laughs> they're good books <laughs> yeah um yeah but you get she's basically playing you know the 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 female friend to talk to in this situation but they these characters are more fleshed out than say in i think of uh you've got mail with the um dang it dave the dave Chappelle character being tom oh, hanks's sure. friend it's like that character is barely a character in the movie he literally feels like um a like at that that character feels like it's checking the box of main character's friend that he can talk yeah. to whereas this movie feels like they're real characters and i love the scene where they do like the double date <laughs> and, oh yeah uh bruno curvy they're trying to set him up with each other and um jess is just not that interested in anything that was it restaurants saying. are to the 80s what <laughs> restaurants were to the 60s right. and it's like i wrote that <laughs> Yeah, what what theater was to the 60s. Yeah, he's like, oh, what theater was to the 60s, right? Yeah. 
and then she's like i just don't really like this writer and he's like oh well, that writer's the <laughs> reason i became, became a, writer. a writer but it's not a big deal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just like stuff like that the writing is so sharp and so all you guys things. are both from new jersey yeah where are you from haddonfield no. oh cool <laughs> like that's yeah the, the that's where like the the writing is great and the performance is just elevated so much it's it's mm -hmm. a great i don't this is as far as just like comedies go this is just one of my favorites it's just so quick it's and so light smartly written and yeah. so smartly written it's just like i can always watch this movie um i don't it's not like an annual watch for me but i do put it on fairly regularly so i it's think just it could be i, really I think enjoy. um obviously that i'll have what she's having after the uh, fake orgasm scene is is iconic but right i don't know man the baby talk that's not a saying <laughs> oh because baby fish math is sweeping the nation yeah. is so much more funny it's so funny well the, i i have what she having that whole scene is like sell, sold because of that line so i understand mm -hmm. why that line is like the kind of the standout and like makes like the afi best movie also at, uh, yeah at cat's delicatessen there's a when harry met sally this yeah. is where it was kind of thing there's like a sign where the where the table is so yeah yeah and also that like whole conversation that goes into the honesty thing where it's like it's bringing up something apparently so apparently that was based on a real conversation that efron had with rob reiner where <laughs> she was like where rob reiner had said a few things like the whole cuddling thing 30 seconds to all night kind of conversation where he was like these are some things that guys think about from his own perspective and he was like no I, we've told you some stuff that guys think about what's some stuff that women um, do that guys don't know about and she brought up that women fake orgasms <laughs> and rob reiner's response to that apparently was well they haven't with me <laughs> 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 to which point how it, would you know <laughs> to, to which point that then immediately made it in the script and yeah. then also rob reiner did a poll around the office with all of the women that were <laughs> working on the set <laughs> and um he said that pretty much all of them said yes they have <laughs> so he was like had to put himself in check like immediately for that <laughs> well but to it, be fair man could be a great lover they didn't ask any of his ex. Yeah, but I could definitely see. I can definitely see. I could definitely see that scene being like a big deal, especially at oh, the yeah. time when it came out. Like I understand that. Oh yeah. Because they talked about seeing it in theaters, like watching it with an audience, and like Nora Ephron was like, the women were like cracking up at that scene, and the men in the theater were like dead silent. The men were uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> so that's funny. It's just kind of a funny thing because I yeah that scene is really funny, and if it were like like the scene that people know from the movie um nowadays watching it i don't think it stands out quite as much but i can definitely i know i can tell why it became that but yeah the the cast is they're just they're all so good apparently that was meg ryan's idea to do it on set <laughs> yeah the the fake orgasm thing but i do know billy crystal was the one who came up with the line with yes um the the, i'll have what she's having and yeah. rob reiner's mother is the one who delivers it which is even funnier even funnier well apparently um rob reiner was um acted out that scene yeah, beforehand because meg, meg ryan was like doing it but not as much mm -hmm. as he like needed her to get like the exaggerated comedy out of it which is a hilarious thing to which, say <laughs> which is and so rob reiner like did the scene in front of her for her yeah <laughs> and apparently he leaned over to billy crystal he's like that was a bad idea because <laughs> Crystal's like why he's like i just orgasmed in front of my mom <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah it's just I, that's kind of also too like everything in this movie like when they were talking about it in the commentary like it really like i said it's just this collaborative process where all of these people and all of the best stuff was just making it into the movie from all these different perspectives i wish we could hear meg ryan talk more about these things but this was a commentary filmed in the 2000s and she's really distanced herself from this image that she originally had in hollywood yeah of, so i understand her not of, like of being the romantic that. comedy woman yeah i mean that's how she broke out was with this movie and then kept mm -hmm. being that for the next few years before she started doing stuff to specifically break out of that image i will uh, say this it feels like uh going to rob reiner for a moment if it really does feel like the performances and the writing as a collaborative thing seem like to be what his movies are best at somehow yeah because this is spinal tap i can point to stand by me i can absolutely point to the Princess Bride, I can point to. Misery, mm -hmm. I can point to. And A Few Good Men. Just all of those movies in those first eight years, absolutely, I can point to. Everything being collaborative. It's great. Yeah. 
Rob Reiner was really setting himself up to be one of the great directors, I think. Um, that clearly didn't happen for his whole career, because after A Few Good Men, it kind of dropped off pretty hard in terms of the quality of what he was producing. I don't know what exactly happened there, but maybe it's just like he had the spark that was... I mean, he was coming off of TV. Um, he has connected. He has a lot of industry connections. All in the Family was a huge show for television. It changed the face of television in a lot of ways and he was a big part of that mm -hmm. um but then his transition to filmmaking like you said i mean he had spinal tap and then he had the surest thing which not a lot of people have seen the surest thing i haven't seen it personally um, i haven't I've, either I've heard, so i didn't want to comment yeah, on it i've heard decent things about it but i don't know personally but then like that five movie stretch of stand by me the princess bride when harry met sally misery and a few good men the man was like just crushing it in so many different genres it's unreal yeah that the drop off after that is so none like, of them are stark. similar like yeah like a princess bride and when harry met sally are the closest things because they're considered romantic comedies but like they're different yeah very different one of them is an action adventure romantic comedy this one is more of like a social romantic comedy so yeah it's kind of insane the differences yeah i mean it's it's a coming of age novel adaptation mm -hmm. it is um a fantasy adventure romance and then it's a straight up romantic comedy then you have a horror thriller in yeah. misery and then you have a military um courtroom drama yeah <laughs> a few good men like they're so vastly different they're just also but also good. this is spinal tap is one of the greatest mockumentaries yes, ever absolutely. made so like he even he even dabbles in that yeah like he set off the whole chain of christopher guest movies of oh these yeah mockumentaries which i love all of those for the most part <laughs> there's a few that aren't as good but i mean yeah and without spinal tap who's who's to say where like we'd be with stuff like the office or parks and rec like television yeah. how that's evolved i think that yep. spinal tap has had an immense influence on that kind of in because it's now. a mockumentary but people actually still believe that spinal tap was a legitimate band right well because of how good it was <laughs> because of how, because good of it how was. real it was yeah <laughs> yeah they've gone on like i think they did a couple of tours they did as spinal tap they did which is just so funny but that's because it, the music was so fleshed out it's like imagine imagine the gorillas coming out as a mockumentary and then that's how they became a band that's a yeah. bit like what happened there. <laughs> yeah but in the but in the 80s <laughs> right it's just kind of wild <laughs> spinal tap is great we'll cover spinal tap someday i'm sure oh yes please <laughs> i love that movie um Honestly, I can see us covering all of six of these like early. See, Reiner Spinal Tap movies. wouldn't be a ten out of ten for us because we have to turn it up to eleven. Oh, <laughs> we might just turn it up to eleven just for for those who know, case. you know. Yes, um, that quote alone gets Spinal Tap to a two on the impact. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. So, I guess the the kind of pitch apparently that Rob Reiner though gave to Efron here was that it's can men and women be friends but then also they become friends and then once they have sex it ruins everything and so there is the point in the movie after they go through their whole friendship arcs because they both are in a situation where their most significant relationship has come to an end billy crystal's yeah. marriage and sally's um, long-term relationship with joe which is his marriage he finds out is has all been a lie yeah so that sucks that would right that would scar me. Um, but Joe and Sally's relationship, she finds out that she could have married him like the whole time. It's just that he only had cold feet because it was her. Yeah, she has a great Supposedly. monologue when she's like that first night where Billy Crystal and her are just kind of hanging out and kind of commiserating together. Mm -hmm. And they're at just like dinner together. And she's monologuing about like how great her life felt um where she's like we can have sex on the kitchen floor we can fly off to rome at any moment's notice you know but yeah. then it's like but you never you, do but we never did fly off to rome and he asked what about the sex no on sex the on the floor yeah sex on the kitchen floor no it's a cold ceramic mexican tile <laughs> tile and it was never gonna happen yeah. um it's like the fantasy of the life that is like the or basically together without children the life that you want versus the life that you get yeah she wasn't actually going to ever get that from that relationship is what she realized especially yeah. when she realized maybe i do want a family someday 
you know, and then he didn't want that. But then later she doesn't, she kind of pushes those emotions down until later when he is getting married all of a sudden to somebody else. And she's like, she was supposed to be a transitional person. I love the, I love the phrase transitional girl. Yeah. Or like a transitional <laughs> like relationship because it's hilarious to me. Yeah. I, I would feel so bad to be considered a transitional relationship right. i mean that, that is kind be, of a thing a lot of the times when you're coming out of something it, it feels like a mutual it has to be a mutual thing though in order for it to be healthy right <laughs> right i don't think there's any way for a transitional person to really be healthy yeah um i think that it can end amicably amicably well, but both people are i think it can be healthy but yeah i don't i don't see how one person one person thinking oh this will be just a temporary thing and then and then i'll break it off and then i'll find the love of my life and like the other person is like oh cool i found the love of my life i don't see how that's a healthy relationship <laughs> yeah i mean and also just like maybe even not even thinking about it that way but just ending up with somebody else and then as in a transitional period of your life when you're not quite ready for a new relationship but you want to not be thinking about the old relationship i guess but yeah, I mean, obviously that's all tricky and just dealing with that in life. I mean, in a way, I could have Men been a trans... Men and women, so <laughs> tricky. Not to get too much into stuff with my own marriage, but I could have potentially been a transitional person <laughs> within my relationship. Neither of us... <laughs> You're a transitional us... <laughs> marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but Hannah had a significant relationship before me and nobody in between. And it just kind of ended up the way that it did. And then I... It, I, I'm so happy that I was able to find man, what person luck. that way. She had already found the transitional man. <laughs> yeah, she transitioned before me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's just... I, yeah, like I said, the movie just feels very honest from a perspective. which I is, suspect because it is. Yeah, which <laughs> it is essentially all, is. All right, which for, like, a movie like this, though, that's all I can really ask for, you know? I don't need it to be 100% accurate. I don't need it to, like, it does stereotype a bit within gender, I, like, relationships and everything. But, like, I, it's Everyone stereo did back in those days. But everybody did back in those days. And once again, it still feels like it's truthful. It doesn't, like, at least from a perspective. So, like, I... I would say normatively, yeah. it's there's still stereotypes. For sure, there are definitely whether some. whether whether they occur or not, or whether they're frequent or not. I'd say people do still believe that there are. So. Right. Yeah, for sure. And so there's still some universal truths that are found in here, even when it's coming from a an, a perspective of the, the late universal 80s. truth that man in the eighties, yeah. Billy Crystal, had great hair. <laughs> had great hair. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, Roman Emperor Harry, he had like when he had when he had that like scruffy looking beard, like for the uh, he was looking for, good like, with the 1984. The he was yeah. looking real good with the beard. Yeah, he no, should have kept the beard. He, he was looking handsome with the beard. I'm not gonna lie. I was like, I don't typically see Billy Crystal as like a very handsome man, but with the fall fashion, Mike Wazowski, like those, he's got a good eye. <laughs> those cable knit sweaters with like the little bit of scruff, you know, the depression scruff. I was like, <laughs> he's looking pretty good right now. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> uh, why do i feel like that's that's like a type of that's like a name of a color like there's true cyan Dep and then there's depression gray depression gray depression yeah. gray <laughs> yeah but yeah once so then yeah once that happens though where she finds out that he's getting married and the water kind of breaks for like or the dam breaks for her emotions to come through um and then he goes over to comfort her and at that point you already had the uh new year's scene earlier in the movie where you could tell that they were like falling for each other um, there was some will they will they won't they with some fear there too though of like ruining the friendship still yeah um and then here so it does a good job of sprinkling in those emotions like we said in the museum scene too and uh so here you get kind of the fulfillment of that at the wrong time, though, because <laughs> she was extremely emotionally vulnerable and he was there to comfort her. And that resulted in something that he should have said no to pretty easily. And um, she was clearly emotionally vulnerable. I'm not going to say that he took advantage of her because he was comforting her and she did want it. Well, um, I would I would say she is fully capable of making her own decisions right, as well. I too. wouldn't say I wouldn't say just because you're crying doesn't mean you're not 
conscious of what you're right. doing. Right. It doesn't. I don't feel like the movie. It doesn't feel like he's taking advantage of her because I don't think either one of them mutual, is taking advantage of the other. It was a mutual bad decision. <laughs> yeah, um, that they made in that moment. I wouldn't that, even call it. I I wouldn't even call it a bad decision because yeah. of the fact that what it led to. Because yeah, ultimately. It, it made them more open about their feelings, which I always consider a good thing. Yeah, yeah. It may have happened at the wrong time, but I think that it was the inevitable, like, the relationship I do think was going to come into this conversation at some point once they realized that their feelings were stronger for each other than they were allowing themselves to think. Um, anyway, so this just kind of sped along that pro <laughs> process. Inter interesting discussion to have, but I feel like especially the the morning or not even yeah the morning after they he's trying to get out the door so he feels it was a mistake she doesn't feel it was a mistake until he leaves then she goes like was it a mistake did i force too much upon him when yeah. he's like i shouldn't have done this because now i feel bad that i don't feel much more than i should kind of thing so it feels it feels very much like i get that she was emotional but it feels yeah. like uh, both sides, if they were in the wrong, then they were in the wrong because they didn't consider each other. Yes. Yeah. So I, think I would that consider well. that to be the point of the movie. Yeah. There should have been some like step of communication within there before they took yeah. the next step to like confirm that, hey, maybe we do want to move forward in our relationship in a different way than we both expected. So, but there wasn't the conversation. And so he, in a very um, stereotypical man kind of way, kind of shuts down and like didn't know like didn't process it at all and through his actions of like i wouldn't even say that stereotypical yeah, that happens quite often actually that does. <laughs> it, uh, yeah it is stereotypical because it is common <laughs> yeah. um but uh I, it's a great shot where she's like afterwards snuggling up on him and his face is just like his, his eyes are wide yeah, open his, his terrified <laughs> face he's are you comfortable yeah i'm good do you want anything to drink uh no water. i'm good <laughs> no i'm good i'm gonna get some water uh, okay, are you water sure i'm it. gonna get some water uh, yep water's good <laughs> do you want to watch anything uh only if you want to <laughs> do you want to go to bed <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah only if you want to <laughs> yeah like he's like he's not there anymore you know he doesn't know how to handle it and he doesn't yeah. handle it um which that so, also might be a scarring from like he obviously hasn't let himself be emotionally in a relationship since right. his marriage which only one of them was a assumption because of the movie because the movie is explicitly saying that it was basically a lie so only one of them was in that state of mind so obviously he's feeling the after effects of that he hasn't been in an emotional relationship since then it's mostly been physical the physical stuff has happened with an emotional partner so i could i could see the mixed feelings <laughs> yeah me, me personally i see it yeah absolutely yeah and then so that kind of follows through with for the last like 20 minutes of the movie leading up to the ending you have them mad at each other and everything including at the wedding scene where she hits him and he, that's where he finally calls her out he keeps giving her the phone calls and everything and she's not really responding to him yeah um and yeah by but then it's we haven't really talked about the use of music in this movie which we also big... haven't even talked about the 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 couple's scenes yes okay two okay, let's, throughout starting with like the music first sure um there was a really smart decision that has had ripple effects through the whole romantic comedy genre since this movie came out and no score a, just just soundtracks of like, yes, good music um to use the old standards as you would say yeah um the the use of those even in so they got mark shaman who billy crystal knew through snl and um he just has like this deep knowledge of these old standards. And so a lot of the score is just him playing piano mm -hmm. um, versions of these songs, which is great. It's perfect. It really hammers in kind of the coziness of the movie too. And just kind of like, it's weird thinking of romantic comedies without those things in, in it because it's become such a staple since this movie. Um, I would say it builds on motifs given by the, so like the Louis Armstrong excerpts. Yeah. So using the piano riffs from those kind of songs would reprise a kind of emotion that you feel yeah. from the scenes. It's very it's smart for a romantic comedy, I would say. Yeah. And they got Harry Connick Jr. to do some compositions for them as well and new versions of songs, which he was only 20 at the time. So it's kind of like a big deal for Harry Connick Jr. at that point in his career. Yeah, he <laughs> um, won a Grammy. 
Yeah, so, yeah, Harry Connick Jr., you know, of Iron Giant fame. <laughs> 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 but for real, though, like, he's, like, it was a really smart thing to kind of use this o- older music. It really helps the tone and feeling of this movie and the consistency of it. It's, it was a really good decision there um, that I think carries a lot of weight just through the genre as it's gone on over the years. Um, and then also, yeah, like you said, the old couples, which... Did was they originally, talk about the commentary? Yeah, it was originally going to be, um, they interviewed a lot of older couples telling their stories, but yeah. they found out that um, it wasn't going to be as dynamic and as concise as they needed it to be for a movie, so they took those stories. Oh, made you're them more... telling me that old people ramble? <laughs> they, they, yeah, <laughs> they, they took those stories and they wrote, and Efron wrote them to be more concise. Um, one of the stories, the one where she's like at the end of it, like, I knew, like, I know a good melon. That was apparently her own parents' stories, but they did get these elderly actors to do it. And I don't know yeah. who these actors are, but they're all they great. play them. <laughs> what is the, I think, uh, shoot, it's. <sighs> Is it the the one where they're talking over each other is just the funniest thing to me. Yes. <laughs> I think it's the, it's the one where they're talking about like they lived they lived in Brooklyn like on, on separate floors. floors. Yeah. yeah, on separate floors and then they go to a hotel in Chicago and that's where they meet and they're like yeah. we were just nine floors apart. And <laughs> Yeah, it's like, just so funny them talking mm-hmm. over each other as if like they're not paying attention to each other. They're just like yeah. answering the question that one person I'm just imagining the interviewer just like looking between the two of them like okay, stop. Please 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 stop stop one yeah. at a time one at a time <laughs> the older guy or the the guy in that conversation apparently was uh one of the groomsmen or the best man at rob reiner's dad's wedding <laughs> and he's also a comic so oh, good. he's just he was just a really old comic who probably didn't have a lot of like actual i don't know how many how much acting experience these people have in feature films but they're so good that i for years i believed that they were just like actual old couples they seem like it like the they um, really do (laughs) what is it the like italian mobster looking guy he looks like this is this this is after my third divorce i i look at her at a funeral and i say i remember this to this day i i say what do i say what are you doing (laughs) after this it's like (laughs) picking up a woman after a funeral wow bold yeah Yeah, it's just really yeah. funny. And it's also a Those great framing favorite. device. It's a great framing device where it kind of splits up the time periods too. Yep. Um, you get those between every time that there's any kind of time jump in the movie. Um, it just works really well. And it also hammers in the theme of the movie too. And that this whole movie is one of these stories essentially, which is brought home by them, Billy Crystal and um, Meg Ryan being on the couch at the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just great. And that whole scene was another improvised scene where they're talking about the cake and like getting the chocolate sauce on the side. <laughs> that was improvised. That was all improvised, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's just, I feel like that there are just like a ton of scenes that are just improvised in this and it's better for it. Yeah, they just kind of there's a free creative process here going on where yeah. they're like ideas are coming up, Efron writes some script to it, and then they go into the scene and there's improv on set and they allow that to just kind of flow and do what it does it's just yeah it's just this i can it's a perfect collaboration yeah i can really tell between you brought it up before the 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 phone call scene between jess marie and then yes harry and sally that kind of thing where it's where it's yeah where it's all set up and it's it all needs to be perfect like everything Mm -hmm. needs to be perfect and it was but i can i can distinctly tell the difference between that kind of scene and another kind of scene like a one of the diner scenes where it's just completely realistic talking right that it's just so strange but i love it (laughs) yeah 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 absolutely yeah it's a strange feeling but it's good which that phone call scene is great. That was Diablo Cody, or not Diablo Cody. Sorry, you mentioned Juno earlier today, and I thought Diablo <laughs> Cody. <laughs> everything is Juno now. Michael Sarah's in everything. Um, as uh, uh, Nora Ephron's idea, she apparently um, had Reiner watch um, a movie. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now. It was... Is it Casablanca? Indiscreet. No, oh, Indiscreet. Okay. Um <laughs> 
Indiscreet is another movie with Ingrid Bergman in it and Cary Grant, and that has some split screen scenes that she brought up to him as like an idea for it. And they do use that a few times, I think, in really great ways in the movie, both with the Casablanca thing where they're watching it together, which is just really funny that that's just I something that. Rob Reiner and Billy Crystal did together, apparently. <laughs> so they brought that into the script from their experience. <laughs> it's the it's the first Discord watch together. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh then um yeah, then you obviously have the cell phone scene where you had the two of them in the bed, Carrie Fisher and Bruno Kirby, and then you had Sally in one set on a phone and Billy Crystal in another set on a phone. And, and um just having to nail that timing, yeah, I can only imagine it's such a specifically like it has to be written that way to get a scene like yeah. that down like that. And then even like the phone clicks at the end are kum, 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 like, I one, actually two, three, I actually watched it four times so that I could pick apart and just focus on each individual person and what they say during it. And it's yeah. so smartly written that every single line of dialogue, if you just cut it between the two people that are talking, like Jess or Harry or Sally and Marie. If you right. just focus on those two people, they have a complete, thoughtful, like, smart conversation in and of itself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's great. Um, it's good stuff. Yeah. And then, so obviously we brought up Efron a number of times because as a writer, she's kind of made a name for herself, especially within romantic comedies in film. Um, she, she only wrote a handful of films ultimately, but she just had this major stamp on the genre um with this and then the sleepless in seattle and um you've got mail you've got mail in the early 90s and then she wrote stuff like julie and julia and she wrote a couple other things that i haven't seen but oh, that's right um, she did do julie and julia yeah and man yeah, she's... meryl streep is literally julia Ch julia child in the movie <laughs> i've not seen that one so that's yeah I i've been wanting to watch it but hannah wants to watch it too so <laughs> Um, Julia Childs is like a character of herself, so it's it's pretty easy to yeah. nail because it's it's easy to nail exaggerations. It's like doing an Ozzy Osbourne impression. Everybody can do it because it's so over the top. But yeah, right, it's right. it's still good. It's still hard to get like a good performance out of just an impression. Oh sure, so it's bringing in a characterization to all of that is significant. Um, that's like what kind of like with Capote when we talked about Capote with like the Crash episode. Um, I think that Philip Seymour Hoffman's giving a great performance there, even though it's such well, a that might be one of the person. Yeah, that that's that's definitely the go to for like one of the best impressions of anybody I can think right. of. It's great. At, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, and she's she's had an impact just in her writing, like we said, for the romantic comedy stuff. Um, she died in like 2006 or 2012 i can't remember no it's like 2012 i think unfortunately but um yeah reiner's still around making some movies um, not as good though they haven't been as good since the early 90s unfortunately but he's not to say he hasn't made anything good since then but i wonder if this is a case of obviously he has a hand in in the writing for his movies i imagine but i wonder if it's a case of like a tim burton where the writing of the movie is subpar because he just doesn't have the same writers or doesn't have the same themes because maybe it's it's mostly him directing and then somebody else writing yeah he surrounds himself with excellent writers like william goldman writing his which he wrote the original princess died bride um book mm -hmm. and then he also wrote the screenplay for the movie like he would just surround it um few good men obviously has aaron sorkin writing yeah. it so maybe that is the key yeah that was I the introduction think, for sorkin now yeah i do think oh, reiner yeah. is a great director like this is a really well directed film i maybe it's just that he understands the beats of comedy really well i think too um with his years of knowing people like various brooks's um albert or mel or whoever else um, the, the the brooks's and uh yeah i i i this is a really well made film really well directed film it is it's it's just put together yeah i i don't know exactly once again why the kind of spark that he had that was lining him up to be like i said one of the all-time great directors just kind of fell off after a few good men but 
Or give some credit yeah. to Stephen King. That's two of those six movies. Two of the six Stephen King wrote the novels for sure. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Very and different that's, movies though. That, that is two of <laughs> two of the six of the like two of the best Stephen King like adaptations put to film. Absolutely. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. As far as I'm concerned, um, I don't really like the Green Mile. So for me, Frank Darabont. I'm I'm glad you said something because if we were ever going to bring that up, I was going to be like, cut about 45 minutes from that movie. It's a <laughs> much know, better it's movie so for long. it. It's so long. <laughs> yeah, it's cause, cause so Shawshank, long. Shawshank is so well paced, so good. Same director, same source writer. You know, it should feel like it goes. But it's in also a just a short way. story. So it's if we're calling it an story. adaptation, probably probably yeah. not an adaptation, more so like an expansion on on the on the story. True. I would say. Yeah, too much expansion for Green Mile. It's a bit, it's a bit like Sleepy <laughs> Hollow and the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, I don't really have any much anything else really more to say about the movie. I think it's, I, I love it. I think it's great. I'm good. Um, yeah. Do you want to move into scoring? Yeah, I, I will note. I did watch this, no joke, four times. Uh, two of those I just put in the background because, for for me to get the comedy beats, I just kind of have to watch it multiple times. Mm. So. And it's a good um, one to just have on too. It is. Yeah. I actually kind of love the Blu-ray that I have of this, which I normally hate in a Blu-ray when it doesn't have a menu at all. But this one, once the movie it just ends, goes straight it, into it, it just loops back to the beginning. It just, it just loops starts back to the over. Beginning. <laughs> yeah, it has extra features and everything that you can find in like sub menus, but like it doesn't have a regular menu. <laughs> right. So I'm like, this is a great to just put on at a party. You know, they say people in comas can still hear. <laughs> so maybe put this in the coma patient's room and just leave it. Just leave it. Leave them to it. They come up with very specific opinions about gender. They, they 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 come out of the man. This is this is turning dark. They come out of the coma and then they can just quote it uh, throughout. It's like that scene can. from The Office where where Pete does the entirety of Die Hard. Oh yeah, I think there's like, I forget what show it is. It's some, there's some sitcom where somebody uses the end quote from this movie. Um, to like he rips it off the end quote from this movie to tell somebody else like how much they love him i don't remember but probably that, that whole, i wouldn't like, i wouldn't be surprised if community did something like that yeah i love that um, it's still good that you get cold when it's 71 degrees outside i love the <laughs> crinkle above your nose when you look at me i like love I'm that crazy. it takes you nine hours to order a sandwich <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like that whole monologue is great, and the, the, also I yeah. love the crinkle that you make in your forehead when you get mad at me, and it and it's like it, it cuts to her, and she's got that crinkle yeah. in her forehead, well, like and when, he, when, when she's mad at her. Yeah, because he him. says when you're looking at me like I'm crazy. When you're looking at me, say, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great, oh, it's such a good like conclusion, yeah, the, and him running with like the music kicking in of like the it had to be you, which they had played on piano throughout the movie at different points in subtle ways. Mm -hmm. and then just kind of letting the sinatra version of that just kind of play out you know when he's like sprinting to this party that she's trying to leave i don't know it's just great it really is like Way it's to great be subtle, editing Frank. great structure yeah it, it had to be you oh come on <laughs> but they kind of made that the kind of the theme for the movie which is great yeah i also like the um uh what is the last, th last thing he says before he before he riffs on uh old uh he said, "Because when you want, when you find out, because yeah, because when you know you want to spend the rest, you of, your you spend with, the rest of your yeah. life with somebody, you want that rest of your life to start at as soon as possible. As soon yeah. as possible. Yeah, it's yeah. such a, it's so good. That's it's just good all good. It is good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I love this movie. Yeah, I have no shame about loving it. I also love that in the romantic um, comedy genre that it usually it skews a little bit one way or the other." you know, with sure. male or female character, depending. And I love that this one really is truly equal time between them, you know? Like, you get their perspectives equally, and you get, they have each character as, as well fleshed out as the other. So. Yep. Let's get into yep. scoring. Yes, scoring. Our first category, writing. We've kind of gushed about the writing a lot in this. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the writing is a pretty Oh, scoring zero to two, zero being poor, uh, one being good, two being great. Very casual conversation. Not exactly what we think the movie is. Just starting a conversation. Let's go. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Writing. writing is an obvious two here. Very yes. smart, smartly written film. It Obviously, deserved its nomination. It was a strong year for the writing, like Oscar competition. Oh, nineteen ninety. Yeah. Um. It was so it. Um. Dead Poet Society actually won, which I actually don't even think that one should have. I don't won. mind. I I don't mind it because I love that movie. It's but. a great movie. Um, but I do think Do the Right Thing should have won that. 
Um, but you oh, also sure. had, I forgot that came out that year. Yeah. You also have Crimes and Misdemeanors, the Woody Allen film, Sex yeah. Lies and Videotape, and then When Harry Met Sally or the others. But it was a really that's a really strong lineup for Yeah, of the three movies year. I've seen, I could see any three of them winning. Yeah, for sure. That, the, yeah, that's a that's a tough year to nail down. So mm -hmm. or yeah. specifically for that. Yeah, for the writing, absolutely. Yeah. And can you believe this is the year that um Driving Miss Daisy won Best Picture? <laughs> Oh, it is. let me look this up because I I didn't I didn't research this. I probably should have because like that's why oh man, people made Miss Daisy. That's that's part of what made um the Green Book situation a big deal because mm -hmm. uh Green Book beat Black Klansman and Driving Miss Daisy beat Do the Right Thing, which were both Do the Right Thing the... wasn't even nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, it was. It absolutely was not. It was not. It was not. Are you kidding me? I am not joking you. It was born on the 4th of July, Dead Poet Society, Field of Dreams, and My Left Foot. Field of Dreams was nominated Field over of Do Dreams? the Right Thing. <laughs> yeah. I watched Do the Right Thing and Field of Dreams for the first time if you're, this year. If you're, if you're thinking about uh, what what the thought of movies was in the 1980s, there you go. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Do the Right Thing was only nominated for actor in a supporting role and screenplay. No kidding. Oh my gosh, I'm like mad now. <laughs> <laughs> That's infuriating. Uh, that, just add that field to the of stack dreams. Of, just add oh. that. <laughs> hey, if you build it, they will award you a nomination. Oh, this movie <laughs> sucks. <laughs> Sorry if that's like. I like baseball and I don't like that movie. <laughs> I love baseball and I like, don't I watched, really like that movie. I like I the watched, sentiment uh, of like the, the black socks from the 1910s and the. Uh, I think it's the Yankees, the other team, but like, yeah, it's not best picture. <laughs> no. Yeah, I would have accepted when Harry met Sally over do the, or not over do the right thing over Indiana um, Jones and the Last Crusade. It's a blockbuster, uh, but it's still better than Field of Dreams. Yeah, Field of Dreams is bad, and Diving Miss Driving Miss Davy. I can't speak. Driving, driving Miss Davy <laughs> Daisy is like fine. It's fine. Uh, it's not great. It's not bad, and in no way deserved to be part of the conversation, let alone win. Oh no. Uh, I don't know whether I should bring this up because it's very polar. This is, might be the most controversial movie when it comes to different aspects of it. Have you seen Harlem Nights, the Eddie Murphy movie? I have not. Okay. Uh, that might be the worst movie to ever be nominated for an award. What was it? I'm not joking. For? It was it was nominated for costume design. So this is not like a Suicide Squad won an Academy Award for costume and, or makeup and hairstyling kind of thing because Harlem Nights is just bad. Mm. it's it's atrociously bad <laughs> was that 89 the way that well? crash was in 2004 <laughs> harlem nights is a comedy version of that in 19 oh no yeah oh. we are gonna get backlash on that because people really like that movie it's got like it's got high praise on on film review sites it's well, become kind it, of a cult so. classic i've not seen it so i'm not you're welcome to on it. but i'm just telling you right now if you bring it up i will tear it apart hey if i watch it i'll bring it up in another episode and if i hate it i'll get backlash then but you can take all the back oh, backlash oh glory right was now. in 1989 i would take that over dri over driving, driving Miss Daisy, Miss Daisy or field of dreams yeah they missed they missed the mark in the nominations this oh man year. they did for sure this is they where really it's did. like they only had five to pick from and they managed to blow it <laughs> 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 like really bad <laughs> so i understand why it may have won then like driving miss daisy if those were your options i mean yeah. once again i love um dead poet society um what were the other two uh other two my left foot so daniel day lewis's yeah i haven't seen movie that and and born on the fourth of july the all over stone movie I also haven't seen that, so I have no opinion on that. That's those, actually one I... of the few Oliver Stone movies I haven't seen. Obviously, yeah. Alexander, JFK, and Malcolm. Uh, not Malcolm X. JFK that's Spike and. Lee. Uh, yeah, that's Spike Lee. That's do the right <laughs> thing. Um, uh, JFK and. Um, what other movies has he done? I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm, the only thing I can think of is Natural Born Killers. Oh, you're gonna put you're gonna have to put up tangent on this entire section. Oh, uh, section because we're still in the scoring. <laughs> Oh, he did Wall Street. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that movie. Well, he made both Wall Streets, didn't he? Yeah. Or did he make only the first one? Um, what? When would the sec? Oh, he, no way. He made the Nicolas Cage World Trade Center movie. Uh yeah. Oliver Stone's be like his hits are all in the 
eighties and nineties. I Absolutely. don't think really he has much good after that. Cause he did W I think, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And right now I'm feeling like Adam. Oh McKay yeah. Is Wall street to... money never sleeps. <laughs> I'm feeling like Adam McKay is trying to fill the Oliver Stone shoes and well, more of... so a comedy thing. <laughs> Well, but Man, he's, the, he should have he's succeeding he at hitting his post two thousands shoes, not his pre two oh, thousand yeah. shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll agree with that. Like I said, I haven't seen. Oh my god, he made Snowden. Yeah. Oh, Oliver Stone, what are you doing? I don't know. He's he's got his fascinations with also certain uh, types JFK. Of I like from a movie making perspective, uh, the history. Pardon my French. Total fucking bullshit. But um, JFK revisited through the looking glass. Even worse. My favorite thing about the movie JFK, which I've not seen, is the uh, the Seinfeld episode <laughs> with the multiple shooters. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that, that movie's worth existing just for that, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I think I think you can have a conversation on on who killed JFK without it being so far a conspiracy theory thing that people still believe JFK to be a like a documentary style yeah. series to this day which i yeah. hate it is so bad Ugh. yeah all right, all right. Uh, let's scoring. get back into world building <laughs> um world building i mean it's new york city it's beautifully captured i don't think it does uh, the world of new york that well though i think it's just it's a very it's a very simple take on four friends yes. in new york yes it's a I, bit I like don't... the style of friends like world building like, yeah, I don't believe yes. for a for a second, for a New York minute, that the New York in Friends is the New York in reality. So it's yeah. that kind of thing. The movie's not that concerned with experiencing New York as New York. I think the setting of New York is significant to the movie, and it's shot and captured really well. Um, but I don't think that it's not like it feels like a really significant setting for it to be set in but yeah. as we've said before it doesn't feel like a character in the movie necessarily no um it's just it doesn't feel of... like it adds to it it yeah. doesn't it could be any it could be chicago it wouldn't matter it could be not la because it's tropical and different environment altogether but it could be seattle sleep this is yeah it could be think... seattle and i don't <laughs> I, think it would I do matter think... I do think New York has its own specific flavor, and that is present in this movie. I think that's the people in it, not so but, much. But yeah, I don't think that this movie is that concerned as like so much with that. They are more concerned with these more specific characters and yeah, their and own journey in this place. The so most world building, building we get one. is the Giants Lions game, where yeah. Harry <laughs> Which is, is discussing his divorce. Scene. <laughs> yeah, they're doing the a, wave. He's talking about his divorce. Yeah, it's a very that is a serious that is conversation. The yeah, it's so. It funny. gets me every just, time. He's just doing is. the wave, and then he sits back down, and he's got such a distraught look on his face. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, they're just that, going. Hey, through the that's just being at a Lions game, though. So <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'll give that's the world a sports building joke. You won't get, but some people will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think world building is a solid one because it's yeah. good. So yeah. yes, still good. It's just not great. Characters um, has to be a two. I will accept nothing else. Yeah, characters it's, is a two. It speaks for itself. These characters feel so real because, in a way, they are real. Yeah. So and they have they have the characters characterization that you would expect from from real couples, from real relationships, and from smart smartly written relationships, and that. So yeah, yeah. Even even their best friends don't feel like we said nope. about the Dave Chappelle character. They're just checking <laughs> boxes. It's not like that. They feel like real characters too, yeah. and they add to the comedy of the movie. It's great. Honestly, the most that Carrie Fisher has been given in years, it feels like she was given more in this movie than she was in the sequel trilogy, and that is a sad fact. Sorry, my my inner Star Wars coming out. Yeah, my apologies. It's, it's true though. It's true. <laughs> That's my Star Wars Tourette's coming out. Yeah, we we try not to have too many Star Wars takes. I think on the internet these no, days. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> so... have them. Bring the hatred. <laughs> yeah, hatred. Um, hatred comments will still get us more views. views. It'll boost us in the algorithm. So yes, we'll take them. <laughs> Good. Uh, Let the hate flow through you. <laughs> All right. Next category is directing. Um, I do think the directing here is a two. I think Rob Reiner was really on a hot streak here, and this might be... <laughs> it's hard to say what's my favorite of those movies that he did in those early ones, but it's so good. Ooh. The the shot constructions and everything and the decisions here are all really great, um, especially for a comedy. I think it's a great comedic directorial 
um, film. So I feel a little bit more strongly than I did with Tim Burton when it came to, I don't think this is Rob Reiner's best directed movie Mm. because he's got so many good ones. I think that he has several great ones. Yeah. And then a lot of subpar ones later on in his career. I'm I'm talking about in the eight years, eight eight year span, obviously not the one that we haven't seen the sure thing, but of ones that I would consider better directed movies i think the princess bride misery and few good men stand out stand by me even too so and this is spinal tap for a mockumentary is very good so they're all so different and that's kind of the hard part too because this as a comedy is kind of what i'm thinking of this is one of the better directed comedies that i've seen i think but i think we have to take that into account on uh this is another like meta thing when it comes to our scoring when we yeah. do scoring, we do it against the rest of the movies we've done and the rest of the movies that we've seen that we will do. Yeah. So it's that kind of thing. If I were to take into account... If I were to take into account every single directed movie as that kind of genre of directing, I don't think that's fair to the rest of the movies. I don't think that would be fair to like uh, a blockbuster that's well-directed but it's not well directed compared to other blockbusters so therefore we give it a 1 but i still That's think that this is this. well directed even among other just like you know other films because you have great scenes um like the bedroom split screen yeah um stuff you have like the the you know people mover scenes you also have i think that stylistically he approaches it like i love when it cuts to him running to the party at the end of the movie you get a more handheld feeling to the camera as it's moving like there's a little bit more kinetic energy it just there's a really great sense of the um what the image is presenting and the emotion that it's eliciting um that i really think that the movie that he does really well with the movie the blocking is really good too in these conversational scenes which blocking if you don't know is like literally positioning um, yeah. a lot of time actors and stuff so that they're framing in the right thing. Um, for instance, um, there's like the scene where they're leaving the diner and they're like walking around the car, you know, <laughs> like who's driving kind of situation. And it's yeah. not a stated thing, but that was a definitely a, an intentionally blocked scene, you know, with them like having this kind of like awkward little dance as there's some tension between them getting into the car. Um, stuff like that, that I think the movie does consistently well. Um, and then the like, even stuff though, like where they're hitting baseballs and whatever, and Rob Reiner wanted a specific angle on that shot. And so he had Billy Crystal hit left-handed, even though Billy Crystal's right-handed. And That's what right-handed. I was about to say. Like, like, like Jess is, Jess is a righty and, and Billy's a lefty. And I'm like, what are the odds that he's a lefty? Yeah. Cause 10% of the population. <laughs> dang. That, yeah, that's why his swing yeah. is so, so atrocious. <laughs> it was just to, it was just to fit it in the shot. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so I think there's stuff like that that does go. I think above. I'm not saying that this is the strongest two ever, but I would still get it to a two personally. But we can come back to it. I, yeah, we we should come back to it because, like I like I've always said, directing is the one that I haven't given the most thought about. And also the fact that if if I think a movie is only like a director's fourth or fifth best movie, directing wise, I don't think I can give it a two. Because I'm I'm pitting ag- against everything here. I'm not just pitting it against the rest of his movies. I'm pitting yeah. it against the rest of romantic comedy movies, the rest of just comedy movies, and the rest of movies in general. So it's yeah. it's difficult for me to say um that is the two at this moment. It also goes into kind of the broadness of our thing. I'm saying this yes. is a really well directed movie. I'm saying it's better than good. I think this. I would say so too, but great. I just don't like throwing out twos, just because it's well done. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So we'll loop back to that. Okay. Um, acting. Um, I think, like we said, the performances here, specifically Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan are great yeah they have great chemistry they have great comedic timing both of them um, i love the scene where meg ryan's like at the party at the end of the movie and she's like wanting to leave talking to this guy <laughs> yeah and then she's like i'm gonna go and, she, and then carrie fisher's like you'll never get a cab and she turns and keeps smiling and laughing you know like stuff like that they have great just like comedic presence and compatibility which is great um i would give acting a two here i would as well yeah i, I bonus up 
like even if I was like a 1.5, I would give it a bonus just for like the um, old couples that do such a good job in those cutaways. That is true. Yeah, they they na- every single one. There's no standout for a bad like couple in this movie. That's that's the thing. Right. Yeah. None yeah, of them like, are none of them are awkward or or cringy. Yeah. There's not a lot of significant acting, yeah. side characters, so you really have to nail it on the ones no, it's that just you the are four. presenting, and it, it does present them well, though. So like they're they're all it's all well done. But so, I, yeah, I another thing I like there's the montage that is Billy Crystal calling her and talking about this is early on, and talking about like missing Helen and that kind of thing, and mm-hmm. you see them in I believe it was like a Chinese restaurant. And she's ordering, she's like making all these hand gestures and you can tell she's being extravagant and like high yeah. maintenance with it. And you can see the way the, uh, the waiter, like he's writing stuff down. Then he just looks at Billy Crystal with like the, like, uh, are you serious kind of face? <laughs> that's yeah. So yeah. that kind of comedic style acting. And that's just for like five seconds on screen. And I like that. Yeah. Even the extras in like the diner scene. Yeah. The like, extras they were well. perfectly used. Yeah. Like it doesn't feel like somebody's like, I have no doubt like, that they, uh, I don't know if they, I assume they filmed this on location in New yes. York. It yes. feels like it, but Apparently, if they did, they probably just grabbed random people off the streets of New York because random people <laughs> off the streets of New York are some of the funniest people I've ever seen. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Apparently when they were filming, they were like trying to find all the places that Woody Allen hasn't used. <laughs> they're like what are you they're like actually we're gonna shoot down here and it's like oh what are you yelling shot down uh, this there? Like, went down here. here he didn't use <laughs> yeah. that one i like that that was, a, that was a great accent kyle oh thank you i give you a two <laughs> <laughs> i give i give myself a strong one yeah all right um visuals yeah uh, it's all Is about the mets category? baby <laughs> um i think that this is like i said i think that they capture the beauty of new york really well in this movie and the seasonal stuff too um the the cinematographer here really good yeah the cinematographer here is actually barry sonnenfeld which is crazy because barry sonnenfeld is a director for films like the adams family and men in black and like a ton of other movies he's made a lot of bad movies recently like i would say the visuals on like the adams family (laughs) movies are are the best parts of it though so Yeah, yeah no he's he's a very visual guy and this is like this is a great movie visually honestly like it kind of fits into that he's a very visual guy he uses his eyes to see (laughs) but i love the shots of them just walking around in the fall with those fall colors you know going on and um just yeah every everything just looks good i don't know this movie feels very warm to me and part of that is just the way that they capture everything and um on top of that too the apartments that they're in are great <laughs> that's a great apartments i just like being in those <laughs> even watching through a screen um, man those apartments would be fifteen thousand dollar apartments yeah. in new york nowadays but kind of like a network though even um like the windows behind them like in the bedroom and stuff it was a shot on location in an actual apartment in new york city so um it makes a difference i think when you do that yeah it's i'm i'm still leaning towards a a one because of the fact that like it it just feels good it's good it is good but like it, it's it not felt doing to anything me, elegant it's not doing anything visuals. exceptional to me not not anything that i wouldn't expect in another romantic comedy i think another romantic comedy would probably have like good landscape shots and good coloring and that kind of thing it just wouldn't have the writing that this movie has i don't know i've been watching a lot of romantic comedies and over I, the last few years <laughs> And partly because I started making a list of like ranking every romantic comedy that I watch. So I kind of go out of my way to watch them with Hannah. And my problem with so many of them is just how cold the image leaves me. And this movie, just having that warmth is such an important aspect of it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that it's like the most beautiful movie ever made. Like this isn't going to get a nomination for cinematography or anything like that but i think with like the costuming and the set stuff and the the cinematography this would still get to a two for me but i can see what you're not sure that the costume costume design is any different than like people wore in the 80s and it's just contemporary but it's just like i don't know it's good fall fashion though (laughs) um i i can go with you to a one though i can see what you're saying there it 
it just doesn't do anything exceptional for me but i don't yeah. think the movie is trying to be exceptional in that aspect you probably took right. it, you you probably took that away from it but i don't think it's trying to do that maybe i'm giving it extra credit because i think the movie is better in that aspect than it has any right being <laughs> and so That's maybe fair. i'm giving it bonus points for that so maybe i think a one is fair because you're yeah, still, it's still good. Some, i i would consider something like a groundhog day to have similar visuals but yeah. it's trying to do something different. If it comes off as cold, it's literally cold. It's it's February in in Pennsylvania. It's supposed to be cold, but it's that kind of. I mean, like emotionally cold. <laughs> oh, okay. like when I'm talking well, about that. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're watching the wrong romantic comedies then. <laughs> like very sterile images um, that just yeah don't elicit much outside of the scenery of the location they're shooting in. Yeah, and maybe those would be a zero, but I don't think this would be a two just because it's not that yeah okay i i feel like one is fair so we'll st so stick at a one um yep. editing i actually feel like the editing is a two here i think there's a lot of comedy to be taken out of the editing um like i mentioned with like the way that it'll cut ironically to different things at various points the grapes at the beginning that he's spitting out the window every time it cuts out of it it cracks me up um i think this is a two editing yeah i think i'll agree because the the pacing is is one of its strongest aspects and yeah. pacing can have so much so many effects on on comedy so yeah. yeah i would have to say the editing would be would be really really good in order for the comedy to be better for it yeah i think that we're both pretty high on this movie and we're going to end up with a high score so i'm willing to go back and give directing a one um, because I think I agree too, just kind of with the visual point. Just, just simply kind of... because we, we've talked about the collaborative aspect. I don't think we yeah. can put everything on Rob Reiner. True. Th because of that, I think we can put everything on everybody. So right. as a whole, you know, this yeah. is not this is not his movie. This is our movie, you know, communism. Yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll go back to directing. It's still good. Um, but yeah, we'll stick it out of yep. one. Um, sound sound um i think that sound is a two here again um i think that it has that very distinct use of um piano score i don't think the sound is as flawless as something like a network with like it's on location stuff you get a little bit of wind picking up here and there but that's kind of hard to deal with like a lot of the times i don't know how they did it in network honestly <laughs> um but it's still really what well dealing with dealing with all the wind from New York and everything. Yeah. Like, that. like actual on location shooting and stuff. I mean, uh, Sid they, Sydney Lumet's a professional baby. Right. <laughs> yeah. They still do a really good job with it, but I think I give it extra credit for like its use of its soundtrack and the, the, the scoring elements of it, I think really elevate the whole feel of this movie. I think it would feel completely different without that. In my eyes, again, like to me, sound sound as a whole is sound effects plus score and that's what i'll always call it so if the score if the score is well done it to me is just one point in this because sound covers so much more than just score and soundtrack choices so right I, sometimes i think I, that this yeah where you i picked up that the, oddly enough the the emotion from this movie Sure, it comes from some of the soundtrack and music, but because it doesn't have the score, it doesn't have that little umph for me, because most of the emotion that I get from movies is from the score. Because when I'm when I'm watching a movie, when I'm watching what they're saying or what people are saying on screen, what the actors are doing, it's mostly it's mostly illogical. I'll take away from something and maybe I'll form my own emotion based on my own experiences or that kind of thing. But score gets to me. Like yeah. Like uh, the first f 15 minutes of up, if you take away that score, it's nowhere near as emotional. No. So that's kind of what I get from movies. I think it's still good. I think the s having the soundtrack be the score is a smart thing. It still feels reserved to me. And there's still... It, it, there, there's heavy hitting points, yeah. but it's it still feels reserved to me i don't i for me it, it the way that they use the simple piano um score over a lot of it using those um old standards just really works um for me and i mean the score from the social the network uses well it's of course got a different instrument behind it as the backing but it's got a piano yeah. score consisting of four notes right so it's 
if we're talking simple, that's about as simple as you can get. So, but the right, but there's where things it's, where it's, it's used, just smartly used though. Like the introduction of the it had to be you when it does it is really impactful, I think. And then sprinkling that in at different points works really well at the points that they use it at. And then you also get in the scene where they do sleep together, and that's when that scene finally fades to black. The note that it ends on is a non-resolute note like it ends on a note that doesn't have resolution musically so you feel the more uncomfortable I, in it. it's just really smartly there, used but it feels to me like it's setting the tone for new york when i don't i don't feel like again i don't feel like this is because most of the landscape shots are the ones that have like the louis armstrong songs or that kind of thing and it's the the climax of the movie that uses the frank sinatra it had to be you but it's it's also it it all feels like it's it's setting up the world instead of setting up the characters if that makes sense mm. to me because yeah most of the landscape but i feel like landscape shots the, use that but. um i think that when the, the lyrics of the songs when those do come in though um there's the one song like the oh, i forgot the name of the song but where they're dancing at the first new year's party um the the one it has to do with i don't books. remember the name of that either. I, um the name of the song i could write a book that song oh the harry connick um, jr song yeah yeah um he sings it there but i think that that song um really kind of perfectly encapsulates their kind of journey through this movie and a lot of the music is really cued to that um in kind of on the nose ways but because it's using these old standards like we keep saying um because it's using these very familiar kind of tunes in a contemporary setting, I don't know. It just it just adds something to this movie that I think is really unique to it. And I think that unique quality that this movie has with its sound and everything and the music that it uses is what kind of puts it over the edge. I think it just kind of has a special quality. I don't disagree with you. I just don't feel as strongly. Mm. Well, maybe we'll loop back to that. It, we'll go through the next two and then we'll get back to it because mm -hmm. i feel like the next two are we'll we'll, we'll loop back to that not unlike groundhog day all right um genre being a rom-com this is kind of the rom-com for a long time um i would still see this on trailers for movies as recently as the big sick back in like 2016 i think i remember seeing when that movie came out and was getting good reviews that they're like the best rom-com since when harry met sally like i still see that with sports movies like i saw that on like warrior and stuff like that for rocky <laughs> like the best sports movie since rocky like it's the same thing with when harry met sally but for romantic comedies and i think there's a obvious reasons for that we've talked very highly about this movie sure. um, i'll agree if nothing genre else a this is um i would put this uh in unranked order I would put this with Groundhog Day with Annie Hall and with um, yeah. I keep blanking on this name. Um, I'm just going to look it up real quick because um, but forgetting Sarah Marshall is another good example of like a modern, very, very yeah. well told romantic comedy. But yeah, that's in the different era once movies got more crude, like comedies, yeah. like the R-rated comedy kind of took off in a different way in the 2000s. Well, people also got more crude true openly at least, crude, openly at least yeah. yeah at home crazy stupid love <laughs> crazy stupid love i would consider a great rom-com as well crazy stupid love is a great rom-com good pull <laughs> uh i think that movie's great yeah i love the little twist in it towards the end so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah this one but i understand why this one kind of became i guess like i say in quotes the rocky of romantic comedies the one that keeps getting referenced year after year because it has that populist angle to it but it just also hits on all the other levels that we've already talked about acting writing all these things so yeah. um yeah it's genre as far as the genre category goes it's an easy to it's kind of defined it in a lot of ways for the following years so yeah since genre the category is the one that we we base off of just the genre itself this yeah this is an easy one of the best rom yeah. rom-coms of all time yeah impact is also a two we've referenced a lot of different things in this movie that have carried through just both impacting its specific genre but also just like i mean that i'll have what she's having seen that line is always referenced in the AFI top 100 movie lines list, and it's constantly referenced. Apparently, Nora Ephron said that 
because I, like I said, the Sally character is based on her to some extent, but the ordering thing, like I said, she was on an airplane, she said about 10 years after this movie came out, and when she ordered something in a specific way on an airplane, the stewardess asked, have you seen When Harry Met Sally? <laughs> Which is just a perfect thing to, to happen to somebody. Who I don't have to see it, Dottie. I lived it. Right, oh, I that's, think that, that's that's Pee yeah. Big Adventure, a movie that you don't like, but some people. I have it. I've seen it once, and it was a long time ago, so I can't really speak. To oh it. yeah, sure. Uh, Defend your bad take. No, I'm yeah, just I will. <laughs> it's it's a very it's a very controversial movie, so I see. Yeah, it. I think that um, when Harry met Sally, I think it holds up so well too. Um, that's another thing; it just holds up. This is I a bit like that. Network for me. It it'll it'll stand the test of time easily. Yeah, it'll stand the test of time. I think this is a two star impact. Yeah, it's um, it's. It's definitely got the accolades, the money, and the cultural impact, so that makes it a two. But on paper, for us, it's a two. Regardless of anything else, I still think it is a two, but yeah, it's a, it's a two. All it's right. time to loop back! To sound. Yep. Now the age-old question, do we make this an 8.5 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10? Sorry, giving it away. Spoilers. You can cut that out if you want. <laughs> oh no, he's deliberating. Or his Discord cut out. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was counting. <laughs> I was I've been counting, counting the, the whole time. Oh, no, wait. No, yeah. it is an eight. Uh, now it's an eight or an 8.5 out of 10. I was wrong. Cut that out. I don't want to be wrong on live television. <laughs> um, I still feel pretty strongly about the two in this just because it is that unique quality, I think, pushes it over the top for me. No other movie quite sounds like this. That's just kind of where i stand on it you know what i'm going to agree i'm going to forgo giving us our first 17 out of 20 i will i will continue the streak of us giving things 18 out of 20 instead didn't we give the hurt locker a 17 out of 20 oh did we yeah oh i might not have up updated my uh <laughs> i might not have updated my my thing no i thought we give yeah i think we did give the hurt locker a 17 out of 20 we might have but yeah 18 out of 20 i would have to give that a little listen Lou. Yeah. Yeah, we'll 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 know it once you finish editing that one. That is true. I will I will <laughs> once I finish the audio editing, I will absolutely know that for sure. I look I, I listen back to it and I see that you put up eighteen out of twenty, but we say seventeen out of twenty. You like didn't listen to it well. <laughs> Wait, for her walker uh, specifically? No, no, I'm just making a joke like that you oh, misrepresent okay. it on the visual side of things, even though we say seventeen. <laughs> um yeah, but either way, yeah, this is, I mean, I love this movie. It's Go watch it. It's a great it. movie. Go watch it for sure. It's one of the best of its kind for a reason. Um, holds up, com I think, pretty much completely of its time, but everything is. So that's that's something that of its time is not an insult to a movie. It is just a byproduct of being made at a certain period of time, which everything is. So Yeah, everything, everything is of its time by nature. So Yeah, so... Yeah, it's of its time, not in a bad way, I don't think. I think it's just, I think that adds to it at this point. So, um, yeah, great movie. But um, that's it for the When Harry Met Sally conversation. However, I always get excited about this because every couple of weeks I get a new movie homework assignment, basically. And that's my favorite kind of homework assignment. So what is next week's movie, bro? <laughs> movie, Kyle? All right, so I wanted to... I don't want to give too much about this because I don't know if you've seen it. I'm really hoping you haven't because mm -hmm. I know intimately about this, about this movie. So, and it's not, it's not a very well-known movie among the masses today, even though it was considered a great movie in its time. That's what I'll say. So next week is the week of Thanksgiving. And the things that I think of when I think of Thanksgiving are three things. I think of family. I think of food. And I think of sports, specifically football. Football is always, always on television during Thanksgiving. Parades, sure. That kind of thing, sure. But I've got a movie that deals with two of those things. Okay. And it's two that you're not going to enjoy as much as food, probably. <laughs> Dang it. Are you making are, me watch a football movie? <laughs> I am not making you watch a football movie. I would never do such a thing. Okay. <laughs> We're watching the button. No. Not the blind side. <laughs> Not the blind side. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, we are watching 1994's Hoop Dreams, the documentary. Oh, man. I've been meaning to watch this yes! forever. Yes. No, I have not seen it. You haven't seen it. 
this is our first documentary that we'll do, so I'm excited about that. I'm going uh, I'm going to tell you nothing about this beforehand. All I'm going to ask you is for you to just watch the movie and look up nothing about it. That's yeah, all the I only ask. thing the only thing I know about it is obviously basketball is involved. It's mm -hmm. a documentary. It's like three hours long or something like that. Yeah. And um, Roger Ebert, I think, had it as his number one film of the 90s. Yep. And he said that to Martin Scorsese. Yes. <laughs> to give it extra credit. He yeah, said exactly. It to a great filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. No, he said that. In, he, he, he did have. It's funny because I went back and watched that interview and he, he had Goodfellas, I think, like four. And he looks at Martin Scorsese and goes like, Goodfellas, just a great film. And then Martin Scorsese says, I have nothing to say on the matter. <laughs> I mean, it funny. is a great film, though, so. It is. <laughs> okay, well, Hoop and he Dreams, would know. then. Yes, I'm sure he would. Uh, Hoop Dreams is going to be our movie for next week. That'll do it for us this week on Great American Movie Review. Thank you for joining us. If you prefer us in an audio format, we're available also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. But yeah, like I said, that'll do it for us this week. And we'll see you next week. We'll see you at the movies.